<clears throat> Hello again, this is Jeff Scott. We've been talking about Microsoft Threat Modeling and the Threat Modeling Tool 2016. I've gone over the first part of a demo where I went back and reviewed some of the major concepts. And now what I'd like to do is talk just a little bit about both the Getting Started Guide that you see right here and also the User Guide that you see right here. Okay. So let's first start with the Getting Started Guide. It's about 30 pages long, as you can see right here. Much of it at the beginning is just stuff that, you know, <clears throat> hopefully at least makes sense to you. They talk about the functionality that, he, that it has. It has its own drawing environment. It immediately takes the threats that you have found and it applies the Microsoft Stride approach, remember, spoofing tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. It allows you, when you'll see this, when you look at the tool in just a bit, you can go and create your own template where you only pull those pieces out that you're interested in. It provides an option that you can define your own threats, so if you aren't happy with all the ones or you think that what, what the tool has created for you is incomplete, you can add your own. As it says, by using this, you can graphically identify processes and data flows that compromise an application or services. There is the minimum operating systems, the download link, etc., how you want to install. And as it says, this is what the guide is designed to do. So to start up the tool, and that's what I'm going to do very shortly, you start TMT, which is the Threat Modeling Tool, and I actually have, uh, where is it? Well, okay, I'm going to have to change to the virtual desktop because that's where I've got it loaded, but that's fine. And I have an icon for it. In fact, I'll just do that right now. don't really want to do that right now, but that's okay. So the icon that you see right there, that's the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool 2016 icon. When I double click it, it brings up the actual tool. And what you'll see in just a minute when it comes up is we have our choice on here. You can see I've already created some, so I can open ones that I've already created or I can create a new one. All right, there's the Getting Started Guide. Here I can work with, my, with creating my own templates, and you'll see what those are in a minute, and once I've created them, then I can open my own template. All right, again, you're gonna see all of this in just a matter of minutes. <clears throat> but let's quickly peruse our way through here. So this is the surface right here. This is where you draw your data flow diagram. All right, you're in design view when you do that. Here are all the tools that you have in your palette. As you choose different tools, some of the properties will, become, will come in here. When you switch from design view that you're in here and you go into view and you go to analysis view, the stuff will be filled in down here. In other words, your threats will be realized and they'll be categorized, etc. Okay? The stuff that's over here are referred to as stencils. This is the stencil pane. When I drew mine, what you're going to find is It'll be broken down into different areas. I just use the generic one virtually every time in here. Okay? So, because I should have clicked on that. So you draw things that look like this. All right? The, there are some data flows. There are your processes. Over here, you can't see it very well, but there is an external entity and there's a data store. Every time you draw anything in here, processes, you know, external entities, data stores, they have to be labeled. And you really should label them with something that makes sense. And your data flows are also labeled. They appear in this kind of ugly green and they make it harder to read, but I haven't, there might be a way to move them around or remove the green, but I haven't found what that is yet. All right. 
When you get done, again, when you go from design view to analysis view, you're going to see this stuff down toward the bottom of your screen. All right, You can select an individual threat, but if you don't, you see a listing of all your threats. So it'll look more like this down here. And it'll have everything, including a categorization over what kind of threat it is in the stride mechanism. So you can break that down and review individual threats. You can add your own threats. But what's going to happen is something that looks similar to this. You can go in and you can sort on basically any of these fields that have the underline. So you can sort if I want uh, the state. So if I want to know which ones are started, not started, etc. I can prioritize them from high to low. I can prioritize them based on the stride method, etc. I think by default they're done by ID. When you get done, you can all also go in and choose reports and do different kinds of reports. <clears throat> now here they, they've shown an example of a full report. And with this full report, what it does, for lack of better words, if you can imagine, it starts by showing you the context, the, you know, the whole diagram, then it breaks it down into different levels and it shows it to you. I already mentioned this. They talk in here about going from 2014 to 2016. It, it's really kind of uh, irrelevant for what we're talking about in here. Here's a quick overview, overview rather, of the template. What they say is if you don't like what's in that stencil area there, you can create your own and just add the tools you want. As you get more um, advanced with this and more comfortable with it, that's probably what you do. So they run through the process in here of how you would do that. That is most of it because there it's opening a a brand new template, so I might jump to the other one in just a second. And if you do create your own template, how to upgrade an existing threat model so it's able to use that new template. An analysis of the modeling tool output. So they go over everything that's in here and talk about you know how the how you can go and change the things that are in here. How to file bugs in your threat modeling. What they're mentioning in here basically is you can identify any one of these. You can identify all of them by going down into here and doing a control A or you can click over here and just identify one then right mouse click choose copy threat and then copy that over into your own security bug tracking tool and you'll get something that looks like this. Of course you can also always go in and make changes to it first if you want to before that. That's pretty much it for that document. I know I'm going through this quickly and you might not be getting a lot out of it, but I did want to mention a couple things that are in here. This is a longer document. It's 60 pages, so it's about double the other one. Again, they talk about what you can do with the tool. You can read that at your leisure. They talk about what a threat model is. This is some good stuff. They talk about software-centric threat modeling and what it provides you, how it's linked in with Stride, what everything in Stride means again. We've already seen this several times. They talk about the standard threat mitigations or the standard threats that you can have and how you typically would mitigate against them. Again, this is all stuff that we've seen before. All right. And then they start to go into the tool itself. All right, again, they go through and they talk about it but in here, they show you a drawing, sim similar to the one, if not identical to the one you saw before, but then they go through everything that's in here. So they talk about everything that's in the file menu, everything that's in the edit menu, everything that's in the view menu, everything that's in the settings menu, the different features that you have on your toolbar and what they do, the fact that you can get contextual help by right-clicking. Then they start to break it down. So again, you'll notice that this is the stuff that's in the stencils. So I use the generic ones for all these. So there's, I use the generic process, but you can, if you notice in here, there are what, a dozen or so processes? I also use the generic data store. But if you notice in here, there's between five and 10 data stores. I use the generic data flow. But again, if you notice in here, there are several data flows. I use for the external uh, entity, or what they call external entity, or indicator rather, I used the, uh, the, the generic one for that. 
The truss boundary, I just grabbed again, the generic truss boundary. And you'll notice there's several kinds of those. All right. Then again, they go in and explain some of the stuff in here for you know what each one of these processes means, what each one of the virtually the data stores mean, and they go through all of that stuff that's in here. All right. Then there's an appendix where they go through and they talk about again how to create your own stencil. We already looked at that in the other one very quickly why you'd want to create your own stencil, etc. All of that different stuff is in there. I don't know if there's really anything else that I want to mention for this, but I'll just quickly run through this. No, I don't think there is. All right, so let's take a look at the tool itself. And the way I'm going to do this, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, is um, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to show you some stuff that I've already done. And then we'll, we'll start to do one by ourselves. All right. So the first one that I have in here is a context level or high level DFD. So I'm going to click on that. And it says that it's not found. Well, that's not good. It should be up on my D drive. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for that. and pull it back again because I've got it but I resaved it someplace else. And I probably say, I know where I saved it in fact. So let me bounce back to here. And let's paste them back here. I think that's where I created them originally, so let me try that again. All right, so here is a high level or a contextual level DFD. And I think, at least, that's, I was going to say it's just about all of it, but let me see if I can drag that down just a bit more. That's just about everything. All right. So what we're doing here is we are attempting to create a contextual level diagram for a bank teller application. So I should jump back to here. This is where we'd left off last time. And if we take a look on here, it says let's start with a real world example. You've got a bank teller component, so that's what we're modeling. They give out money to clients. Now notice, because there were some questions on this when I presented this in class a week ago, it says it accepts requests from arbit arbitrary clients. So in other words, anyone can go in there and request money. You know, I want to withdraw some money. But once that's done, they perform authentication and authorization. So they ask the person, who are you? And they need proof of identification. And then they have to go in and they have to check the balance, et cetera, and see if somebody wants to, to withdraw money. First, again, we have to make sure you are who you say you are. And second, after we do that, we've got to make sure that you have, you are authorized, all right, and that you have the money available. So they process those valid requests for cash withdrawals. As it says, the teller is trusted to perform these actions, but they're required to work within the confines of bank policies. In other words, for instance, if you talk about doing something electronically, typically you cannot withdraw over $500 at a time or maybe even a day at an ATM. All right? There's auditing that takes place. So if they're going to go in and uh, if you come in and you want to withdraw $100, they better record that someplace. All right, I already mentioned the threat modeling tool, uh, the use getting started guide and the user guide. As it says, there's the URL for downloading the entire package. All right, very quickly, this is right from the user guide. A threat model is a representation of the software or device components in the system, the data that flows between them and the trust boundaries in the system. When you threat model, you can discover 
potential design vulnerabilities by analyzing the security properties and identifying potential threats. And we talked about this too, that there are technically two different ways to threat model. One is you bring all of your so-called experts into a room and you have them brainstorm. That can be an okay thing to do for a first threat modeling session, but you should have at least a contextual contextual level DFD first. So you've got something and, and they should all everybody there should agree to it that this is indeed what we're going to start to model. The bad part about brainstorming is in a true brainstorming session, no idea, you, you can't comment on ideas. In other words, if I say something that sounds really out there, you can't turn around and say that that's just ridiculous. That makes no sense. You, you keep those comments to yourself, so nothing is out of bounds. But a lot of times people get so fixated on whatever they're interested in in a brainstorming session that very little gets done or you get into disagreements or whatever. All right, but this should start regardless with a context, with a context diagram. As it says, this is a diagram with the components in the middle and all of the external entities on the outside. It should be very simplistic in nature. So that's the one I'm going to show you in just a minute. As I already said, the context diagram should be completed and agreed to before any threat modeling activities begin. It is a point of reference that can be used by everyone involved in the process. It's a common place to start with. So it says, let's, cre let's create a bank teller contact or context diagram or level zero diagram. So this is the same one that I just showed you in the tool. So you've got your customer, who is your external entity. They're attempting to come in, and they're attempting to withdraw some money. Okay? So that's their input into the system. The output is, if, it, if they've been authorized and authenticated, is the money. What has to also happen there is that process transaction has got to take place within the policies of the bank. So again, there might be only a certain amount that you can withdraw at a time, all right? You might have to have a certain name on the account to be able to withdraw it. It might be a joint account, etc. Once that goes through, whether that worked or didn't work, all right, so whether they were authorized or not, some kind of an audit log should be done that should hold the transaction details. Now, typically, that's going to be that the that the that it went through okay and how much was withdrawn. But it could be that someone came in and they weren't who they said they were. So it wouldn't be a bad idea if you came in there and you made the person, you know, if, if a person couldn't prove who they were or they didn't have the money, that should still be logged. Okay? And finally the other data store is going to be in, in a database or someplace in the bank where you're going to have the account balance, the original account balance, and then the new balance after the withdrawal takes place. So again, after you complete the context diagram, you start to drill down and you start to go into more depth and breadth of coverage. So you start from the very general and you move towards the specific. All right. So next, we're going to explode this or make a bigger diagram that's going to be called a level one diagram. And just for, for, for uh, the sake that you see this, the term auth n is authenticate. That's just a shortcut so it would all fit in the, in the bubble there. And as it says, the bank teller must authenticate or make sure that the person who wants to do the withdrawal is who they claim to be. Then you've got auth z, which is authorized. They must make sure the customer has permission to do whatever it is they're attempting to do. So they might, I might walk in there and say, I'm Jeff Scott, but if I don't have an account at the bank, that probably doesn't mean too much to them. So this is in more depth and breadth of coverage. So we'll look at that in a minute, but let's go back to the actual tool. So how did I do this? Well, literally, I used the generic process. These are all the other processes that are in here. I used the generic external indicator, and these are the other external indicators. I used the generic data store, and these are the other data stores. I used the generic data flow, and those are the other data flows. And I use the generic trust boundary, and those are the other trust boundaries. All right. Now, with all of that stuff that's in here, again, this is called your stencil pane. And as you come in here, you can create your own. So if I knew that, that most of the stuff I was going to do wouldn't use 70, 80, 90% of this stuff, I could create my own pane, which would make it much easier to go through this. 
But if I wanted to add another process, literally, I click right here, I drag out, and there's my process. That's literally all that we have to do in here. All right, and that's what it is. So if I wanted to take the, and, and I wanted to hook that onto this, I could come down here then and find the generic data flow. All right, and I could click and put it down here. Come on. Okay, so there it is. So I could take it and hook it up over here. All right, you see that it gets red, which means that it's hooked up on both ends. All right, so literally, that's what this involves. So using the tool is kind of secondary. What's really more important is to be able to go in and identify the symbols and actually model what it is you're trying to do. You'll notice when something is highlighted how it, all right, not the processes, I guess, but most of the other, you know, when any of the things that are in green are highlighted, okay, you can see exactly what they're connected to. So that was the first one. So let me close that. And I don't want to save. All right, and let's look at the level one. So this is the same drawing, but in a little more depth and breadth of coverage. All right, so move that up just a bit. No, I can't move it up too much. I can't get everything in here. Notice I can go down as far as I want. All right, and that's okay, but it's very hard on the page to see what's going on. So let's look at the top half, and then we'll look at the bottom half. So we took this withdrawal process, and we broke it down into an authentication and an authorization process. All right. We've got our trust boundary in here still, but now the customer comes in and they attempt to do a withdrawal. So what happens? Well, they do it. They do that. They send their withdrawal request. We come in and we authenticate and we authorize. If everything is okay, we go through the same stuff that we went through before. All right. But it's only if the actual thing worked that we're performing the transaction. So this is all we had in there before. So we're doing the same stuff, but we're starting to explode what we had into more detail. So in the original one where we just had the transaction process, that really should have been a double circle. And there, there probably is a, a, a tool thing in there for a double circle, but I didn't know what it was. Okay, So it's the same one that we had before, but it's just more detail because we're drilling down, so to speak. Again, that's it right here. Now, as mentioned here, once this diagram has been completed, so again, you're going into more depth and breadth of coverage, and it's been agreed to, now you start to look through the checks and balances. So you figure out where the entry points are, where the exit points are, what are your assets. Well, and I, I didn't change that either. It's not protective assets. It's protective assets. All right. So the idea is in a bank, well, what are the assets going to be? Well, they're going to be cash more than anything else. And we've already been discussing where the entry points are is where somebody can come in. All right. These should be prepared by someone who is not involved, ideally at least, in creating the DFDs. And if that's not possible, it shouldn't be done at the same time the DFDs are created. And the reason for that is it's the same kind of thing that, that when I have a student who has a problem with a program. The worst thing you can do when you have a problem with a program is to spend 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes just looking at your screen and expecting that the longer you look at it, the better the chance are, chances are that you're going to fix the problem. That's not how it works. Because by having other people look at, your, at, at the DFD once you've drawn it, all right, you can have a way of double checking that the system was modeled correctly. But if you're the one doing everything, you're already somewhat prejudiced. But at least if you walk away for a while, you do it on a different day or a different time of the day, ideally, you're coming back with a fresher set of eyes than you had previously. So here's some examples of entry points. You've got the bank trust customer who will be untrusted until they've been authenticated and authorized. You've got the account information. Well, that's trusted. But eventually, you get a list of known bad accounts. So if I keep walking into the bank every day and saying that I'm, I'm John Smith, can I take out $100? And they ask me who I am, and I, I show them my who I am, but it's not John Smith, all right, then John Smith might eventually be put on a bad account list. I mentioned in the class that years ago, many years ago, we're talking about, what, uh, 40 years ago, I worked at a Coles food store 
actually several of them in the Milwaukee area. And at the time, that's when they had the old-fashioned cash registers and the like. And at the time, they would have little index cards on most of the cash registers that would say, do not take checks from these people. All right? And what were they? They were basically a list of bad known accounts. All right. So in the table, you can see that the bank customer and the account information do appear in the DFD, but the list of known bad account numbers does not appear. So we've got to update it to add that. And that's what we have over here. We've also brought the police in. Other than that, it's pretty much the same drawing that you've seen before. Now, I'm just to show you that I do have it, and I did do it. All right, I'll jump back here, and we'll close this, and we'll open up the next level drawing. And there it is. Again, I think it's much, much of an art to be able to do this. I'm not saying that mine looks good or doesn't look good, but I think the more you work with it, the better you get at it. So here's our list of bad accounts. And here's the police. All right. And you'll notice that there's a couple tr boundaries there, and there might even be more that I didn't put in. So if we jump back again to where we were, this is, again, we're drilling down. We're going through this to try to make sure we're modeling everything that is there to be modeled. So an entry point, as it says, it's a way for someone or something to influence the component or be influenced by the component. Anything that sends data or re to or receives data from a component is an entry point. As mentioned here, it should be possible to do a cross-check between data flow diagrams and entry point tables. And that should be possible regardless of the person's security expertise. Notice as mentioned here, looking at threats is a, pro a process of taking each of the DFD objects and thinking about, okay, how could this be exploited? What's wrong with what we currently have type of an idea? There are different ways of doing this, but again, stride in brainstorming or some combination thereof are the ways that are used the most often. With stride, what's spoofing? That's when a malicious person would be pretending to be a customer that they are not. What's tampering? Well, again, in this example, this is about all I could come up with. What if the customer literally was being blackmailed by someone? They were holding a family member hostage or whatever, so they were withdrawing money. The reason I say that, too, over the weekend, I was uh, visiting my daughter in St. Louis, and it was I don't know, Friday night, we went out, and then we came back, and it was late. It was about midnight. We were watching TV. We were watching an old episode of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Criminal Minds, and there was a woman who went into the bank, and there was a guy who, was, who, who had been holding her family hostage and wanted a certain amount of money. Well, that's tampering. That's exactly what the customer was doing. Repudiation, where you're looking to attack the system, you're looking for ways to get into it without being identified. You may have seen things on TV where somebody goes in to rob a bank and they're smart enough to know where the cameras are in the bank and they come in with black spray paint and the first thing they do is they use the spray paint and they spray over the camera so there's a lot less chance they'll be able to tell who the person is. Information disclosure, well the only people who should know about accounts and about balances etc, there's three types. All right, That is the customer, the valid customer I should say, the bank teller, and the personal banker. And really, the bank teller, all that he, she, or they should be able to do is to give a current balance, all right, authenticate and authorize for deposits and withdrawals, and that's about it. Moving on, denial of service. I mentioned this before. If I keep coming in every day and claiming to be someone that I'm not, maybe after time, maybe they not only bring the police at me, but they might freeze that account. So if I come in every day and claim to be John Smith from Janesville, Wisconsin, they might eventually put a freeze on John Smith's account. And then if John comes in and validly wants to take a look at his balance or, put me or, or make a withdrawal, they might say, well, you can't do that. Your account's been frozen, not because of anything they've done. The worst is always the elevation of privilege. And as it says there, where a malicious user can successfully be, pretend to be someone else, maybe withdraw the money from their account. All right? So those are things against the, the bank teller DFD, but things against the customer. The customer tries to use a fake ID, ideally they'll be caught in the authentication process. 
tampering, if a customer is withdrawing unusually large sums of money on a regular basis, there should be some kind of policy that catches that or at least brings it to a bank manager's attention. A friend of mine put on Facebook the other day that he was the victim of an identity theft. And um, he said that was what was really nice about it is somebody tried using two of his credit cards. And he said within five minutes he got calls regarding both of them saying that this this sounds a little bit hinky. And of course, he denied both processes, had them cancel both cards, and was issued new cards. Now, hopefully that'll be less of an, of an issue when we have this new chip that they're supposed to be putting in. All right. Repudiation. As it says, we need an audit process to the system. You saw that logging that was in there. Information disclosure. Any customer-related error should result in an abortion of the process. Denial of service. At least the bank manager should have a list of those known bank bad lists. And probably the tellers, too, so if people come in. And the elevation of privilege, which was the same as what we saw with spoofing. So the final threat modeling model rather is shown right here. It's just been cleaned up a little bit. All right. So as mentioned here, the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool 2016 touts itself as being a one-step, easy-to-use threat modeling tool with ample documentation. The biggest problems I've found with the tool are I didn't think, you know, it's typical Microsoft documentation. It's terse. There's no how-tos. And there, there's really no books that are dedicated to the 2014 or the 2016 models of the tool. All right. That's it for that part of the presentation. The only thing I wanted to mention other than that is I want to go back to this and show you that if you look at what's here, if I bring this up and you see, well, there's nothing in there, Jeff. Yes, there is nothing in there. But if I go from my diagram, so I'm in design mode. If I go into view and I go down to analysis view, you see what gets filled out here. So it shows me from my diagram the different types of threats that I can get. So for instance, I can come in here and I can, you know, I can decide that I want to just look at my elevation of privilege threats, etc. And you can see that there's quite a few of these that have been created. All right. Finally, what I can do is I can go down to reports and I can go to create full report. And if I do that and I do a generate report, it'll save it as an HTML document. So I'll just save it out to the desktop. Of general threat modeling report. All right, so there it is. And if I go back out here now and take a look at it, it's an HTML document. It shows that I have had 19 threats. It shows the entire doc, the entire DFD. Then it starts to break it down and shows me what each in individual threat is. So again, the better the names that you give here, etc., the more complete this report is going to end up being. And that's pretty much it for our Threat Modeling 2016 demo.